Emmanuel. Emmanuel, the word, uh, as all of you know, being translated rather than transliterated means God with us. And you know, God gave Ahaz, king of Judah, and us a sign. And that sign would be Emmanuel, uh, that a virgin would conceive and a child would come forth. And they would name the son Emmanuel, God with us. And that, that sign also gave us a promise that Emmanuel, that's to say Jesus Christ, would defeat all the enemies of God, including Satan himself. We're also going to refresh our memories today concerning the actual birth date of Christ. And, you know, many Christians, once they come to that knowledge of the actual birth date of Christ, all too many of them ponder, well, should we really celebrate Christmas? That's to say, December 25th, or, you know, a lot of people say that's a pagan holiday. Should we celebrate Christmas? We're going to answer that question this morning. So let's begin our study in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, uh, with that sign that God gave to Ahaz, king of Judah, Emmanuel. Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 1. We ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, as always, Father, open eyes, open ears uh, this day. Chapter 7, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Now, a couple things. Ahaz, arguably the worst uh, king of Judah. Probably Manasseh uh, would give him a run for his money, uh, having caused the streets of Jerusalem to run with innocent blood. But Ahaz, he was so rotten that he closed the temple, Solomon's temple. He shuttered it, locked the doors. People weren't allowed to go into the temple. Uh, and you can imagine what happened to the morals and the values of the nation of Israel when that happened. Uh, at the time of Ahaz, they were building little altars to every god under uh, who knows what, fake gods, false gods, on every corner in Jerusalem, it's written. Now, what do we got here, though, coming up against him? Rezin, the king of Syria, that might not surprise us, but the king of Israel, the ten tribes to the north, they're lining up with the Syrians to attack Judah. Uh, that's brother fighting against brother. That wouldn't make our heavenly father happy at all. Verse 2, And it was told the house of David, that's Judah, of course, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, the ten tribes. They're, they're, they're allies. And his, this referring to Judah, heart was moved. And the heart of the people, as the trees of the wood, are moved with the wind. They trembled, in other words. You see, Rezin had been uh, defeating many other nations. Now they're joining up with the ten tribes to the north and coming against Judah. So... Uh, probably reason for Judah to fear, especially when they didn't have their ducks in a row as far as worshiping our Heavenly Father. Things were not going well in Judah at this time at all. They weren't doing things God's way. Verse 3, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah the prophet, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Sherah Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit, that sure our Jayash Ab means remnant shall return. At the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field. Now Fuller's, that's Fuller's like Fuller's soap. And this was an area where they washed clothes and most of them used their feet with the Fuller's soap on the clothing to get it clean. Verse 4, what was the message from God to Ahaz in Judah? And say unto him, to Judah, take heed and be quiet. In other words, be calm, trust God. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and of the son of Remaliah. 
God's saying Ephraim and Syria are only capable of smoking. They're, they're not capable of producing fire. All smoke and no fire, in other words. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil uh, counsel against the saying. They're planning on uh, taking Judah and Jerusalem for themselves. Verse 6. Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabial. Tabial only mentioned here, and it's unknown who this party was. Obviously, it was someone that they knew that they could control like a puppet, or they wouldn't have been interested in putting it in the, in, in him in charge of Jerusalem. But there's only one problem with their plan, you see. It's not God's plan. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. Why? It wasn't God's will. But God wanted Ahaz and the people of Judah to trust him. But no, they, they, they always wanted to go hire somebody, uh, mercenaries, to do their fighting for them in many cases. They didn't trust God. They put their trust in other men. Uh, that did not please our Heavenly Father at all. Verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, the capital of Syria. And the head of Damascus is Rezin, the king, in other words. And within three score and five years, that's 75 years, excuse me, 65 years, shall Ephraim be broken that it not be a people. The ten tribes would be broken they would go into uh, captivity. Verse 9. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, the capital of the ten northern tribes at that time was in Samaria. And the head of Samaria is Remaliah, the king. Uh, Remaliah's son, that of course is Pekah. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall be established. This last phrase, I think better translated, do you not believe it is because you are not stable. And the captivity was coming. That's, that's the reason God sent Isaiah and Jeremiah to, to the, the, the ten northern tribes and Judah was to warn them there is, you're going into captivity, to tell them you're going into captivity. Uh, they tried to make it where that wasn't the case. The ten tribes were going down sooner than uh, the, the Judah even is what this is saying. Verse 10, Moreover, and the Lord added, The Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. God's willing to show him a sign. And, and it was his choice, whether it be in the heavens above or, or beneath. Make your petition deep is what this kind of means to me. Verse 12, but Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Here he's acting all pious, and he wasn't pious at all. He was the worst, one of the worst kings of Judah. But it was serious business tempting the Lord. Uh, warnings against it in the law, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Verse 13. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, the Lord speaking to Judah. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? In other words, Isaiah. This word weary is to exhaust. It means to, to correct. In other words, is it a small thing for you to correct Isaiah? But will you weary my God also? Are you going to correct the Lord as well? And, you know, it's kind of ironic that they would not believe without seeing a sign. But when God offered them a sign in order that they might believe they would not even look. God's going to give them a sign anyway. 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel again translated God with us. That promise, most of you in your Bibles, you have a star which indicates that that prophecy concerns Messiah. This promise is that a Messiah, a Savior, would come to the world. Verse 15, Butter and honey shall he eat 
that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And he would indeed uh, teach us to refuse the evil and choose the good. Skip ahead to chapter 8, verse 1, still in Isaiah. Moreover, the Lord said unto me, speaking to Isaiah, Take thee a great roll, and write in it with a man's pen concerning Meher Shalal Hazbaz. Meher Shalal Hazbaz, Meher in the, uh, the Hebrew language means haste. Shalal means spoil. Hash means speed. Baz means prey. In other words, he hasteneth to the spoil to seize the prey. And don't get lost with this. All this means is that this name is significant for a reason. You see, Satan himself hurries to the spoil to seize the prey. I'm talking about God's children. And Isaiah's son, he's being instructed to name his son. Hurry to the spoil. Seize the prey before Satan does is, is what we can take from this. And I took unto me, Isaiah speaking, faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeber e Kiah. Uh, Zechariah, probably the father in law of Ahaz, king of Judah. Verse 3 And I went unto the prophets, prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Meher Shalal Hazbaz. Meher Shalal Hazbaz. I'll get it out. Verse 4. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry. Not very long down the road, in other words. My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus, the capital of Syria, and the spoil of Samaria, the capital of the ten tribes, the northern tribes of Israel, shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. Uh, the king of Assyria, as you know, Isaiah chapter 14, a type for the Antichrist. They're going into captivity. There's a captivity in the future as well. Unfortunately, many of our brothers and sisters are going to be caught up in the captivity. Uh, they're going to be seized as the spoil and taken as the prey. Verse 5. The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh, that go softly, and rejoice in Rezin and Remaliah's son. In other words, Israel despised God's covenant and Zion. And they're off making covenants with other nations rather than serving God. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. This type for the Antichrist, the king of Assyria. You could think of this flood that's, that we're talking about here as the flood of lies that come out of the Antichrist's mouth. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, uh, excuse me, 8. And he shall pass through Judah. And, and remember, this is a type for future as well. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. That's how deep the lies and deception are going to be. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of the land, O Emmanuel, God with us. Verse 9, associate yourselves, O ye people. Make a friendship with all the other nations, the one world order, if you will. And you shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all ye far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, ye shall be broken in pieces. Twice for emphasis. And, of course, what is it that we should gird ourselves with? Ephesians chapter 6. Gird yourself with the gospel armor. That's the only way that you're going to be able to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Those lies and the deception we've been talking about. Verse 10. 
Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, your own words, not God's word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. Here translated Emmanuel in the Hebrew language. The only way that you can escape the captivity of the Assyrian that's, that's coming in the future is through Emmanuel. He is that shield that causes the fiery darts of Satan to be diverted away from you, a part of that gospel armor. God always keeps his promises. Israel, uh, as he promised, would go into captivity. Uh, Judah itself would go into captivity to the king of Babylon not too many years following. And a virgin would conceive. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Gospel of Luke. Chapter 1, let's pick it up with verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, this course of Zacharias, of course, as you know, would become the father of John the Baptist. But the course of Abiah, that nails down some dates for us. And, and if you're familiar with 1 Chronicles chapter 24, you know that when David was establishing the, the priesthood, if you will, as they would prepare to, for Solomon's temple to be built, he established 24 uh, courses of the priest. And what the priests did, they came on duty on a Sabbath, and they were on duty for a week in Jerusalem. But then when their, their course was finished, they could go on home wherever they lived in Israel. Now, there were 24 courses of the priest, and of course there's 52 weeks in the year. How does that work out? Well, they all served, all the priests came in, no matter where they were from, and served on the three major ingatherings, the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost today, and the Feast of Tabernacles. But then they would rotate through the 24 courses, in effect serving two weeks out of every year. They'd begin with the first course. Abiah just happened to be the eighth course. This, the courses began with the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles. In other words, the, the last day, the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a Sabbath, was the beginning of the first course. So with that knowledge, we nail down a date. Another thing important in that verse to note is that Zacharias' wife, Elizabeth, was of the daughters of Aaron. She had to be to be married to a priest, a Levite. And, and we're going to see that uh, Elizabeth and Mary's mother shared, uh, their mothers were sisters, and therefore both were of the daughters of Aaron, and that's where we get the, the seed line, the genealogy of Christ being of Mary's father, Heli, in Luke chapter 3 of Judah, and her mother being of Levi. Uh, therefore, you have the, the king line and the priest line in Christ's genealogy. Verse 6. And they were both righteous. Uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth we're talking about. Were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. They, they did the best they could to do things God's way. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years, much like Abraham and Sarah. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, the course of Abiah on duty, as a Levitical priest in Jerusalem, according to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord, the holy place. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. That 
was the thought at the time that the prayers of the people went up with the incense to our Heavenly Father. And that's the reason that they were praying at the time of the incense. And there appeared unto him, to Zacharias, an angel of the Lord. We'll learn that this is the archangel Gabriel in verse 19. Of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, just think about it. If, if you were a, a normal human being and a priest, and all of a sudden there was an angel appeared from before your eyes, would that not be uh, quite startling? Of course it would. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. This, of course, would be John the Baptist. And what was it that Zacharias was praying for? His prayers were heard, and he was going to have a son. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Why? Because he was the forerunner. This was not, not anything new. This had been prophesied years and years before. That voice in the wilderness preparing to make way and make ready the way for Messiah. This announces the coming of Messiah in effect. Verse 15, for he shall be great, Gabriel continues, in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He'll have be under the vows of a Nazarite. And he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God, as he baptized unto repentance in that river Jordan. And, and, and the purpose of his coming, that he came in the spirit of Elijah, Malachi uh, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, to return the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Verse 17, and he shall go before him, before Christ, in the spirit and power of Elias, that's Elijah, in the, the transliterated into the Greek, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And there are two. And the disobedient to the, to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Today, there is a people who are prepared for the Lord. They have the seal of God in their forehead, in their minds. They are prepared for the return of the Lord at the second advent. Of course, here we're talking about the first advent. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? Question. This is really good news, but, but how will I know that this is really going to come to pass? Little doubt. For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. We're both very old. Give me a sign that this is going to happen. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, which translated means mighty man of God, that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. But you don't believe me. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, Gabriel's going to be the one that tells Mary that she is with child as well. And, and isn't it ironic that with Zacharias and Elizabeth, it seems like it's a little too late, the promise. But with Mary, who has not been with a man yet, the promise is a little too early. Verse 20. And behold, thou shalt be dumb. This is Gabriel to Zacharias. And not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. And you know, being a priest, Zacharias should have been familiar with the law. That, to know that these things were written, that, that, that they were going to come to pass. And the people waited for Zacharias. This is outside the, the inner courts. And marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. What's taking him so long? And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. 
and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. This word beckoned in the Greek is dianuo, and it means to express with signs. Why was he expressing with signs? Because he couldn't speak. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration, his, his course, in other words, were accomplished, he departed his own, for his own house. Now, he would not have been able to travel the very day after his course was completed because it was a Sabbath. And he lived some 30 miles away. So we're talking that he probably arrived home being an elderly man some uh, two days to travel 30 miles, probably the 21st or 22nd of June. Now, as I said, he was serving the course of Abiah. But there are two possibilities that the, court, the dates of the course of Abiah, because that's, he served twice during the year. So this course of Abiah would have had to have been either June 13th through the 19th or December 6th through the 12th. And we're going to do a little thinking here. Would it be logical? Which of the two would it be logical? And, of course, it's logical that it was June 13th through the 19th. Why? Because had, and he was born six months prior to Christ. So if you make it the December 6th to December 12th, that would have put Jesus being born on December 25th rather than conceived. Now, what's unlogical about that? What's unlogical is... It was very unpopular what the Romans were doing. They called this census, which is taxation, is what it meant. Does that sound familiar? Taxes being raised? Yeah, it does to me too. But anyway, uh, it doesn't make any sense that the Romans already, it's unpopular that they're calling this census for taxation. How much more unpopular would they be if they called them in in December? And look at the weather we've had in December. Can you imagine Mary being full term almost with child, traveling on a donkey through weather like we've had? The shepherds were in the fields at the end of December. You don't have shepherds in the fields. Sheep, if you, you may not be familiar with them, sheep are very sensitive animals. I mean, they can get sick so fast. That's why they have sheep cots. They got to keep them out of the weather. I mean, if you get a sheep wet in the wintertime, you're probably going to have a sick sheep. And so if the shepherds had been out in the fields in December, those muttons would be freezing their mittens off. It was in June. And, and therefore, well, we'll go on here a little bit further and explain more. Verse 24. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth, he went home, in other words, conceived and hid herself five months, saying, and he was to be raised as a Nazarite, and this means that she was avoiding any uncleanness for the five months. Remember, it's six months difference between John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me, to take away my reproach among men. In other words, she was quite old and had been barren. And it was seen as a disgrace for a woman not to be able to give her husband a child. So what she, she's a happy girl that now she is able to give her husband, Zacharias, a child, a son. And in the sixth month... The angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth. Gabriel announced the first advent here and the second in Daniel chapter 8. 27. To a virgin a spouse, this word means engaged, not married. To a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And this is Gabriel. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, much graced, in other words. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And aren't we blessed by the son that she brought forward? 
And when, he saw, when she saw him, Gabriel, she was troubled at his saying, quite disturbed, and cast in her mind, or she deliberated in her mind, what manner of salutation this could be. What, what possible sort of salutation is this? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And you know, I can't help but believe that as God's elect are being prepared for what is to come when the Antichrist is here on earth, we're going to have the two witnesses most assuredly. We're, we're, we're told that in Revelation chapter 11. But you know, I can't help but believe. Think about it. Every time that something way out of the ordinary happens in God's word, what does he do to prepare the people? He sends an angel. He sent Gabriel to first Zacharias. Now he's sending Gabriel to, uh, uh, to Mary. I wouldn't be a bit surprised that that we don't have visitation from angels as God's election saying, okay, you've read, you've studied, you, you, you know that this is what's going to happen because God's word tells us, but I'm here to tell you, God wanted me to come here and tell you, get ready, this is it. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Now then, let's pick it up with 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And again, the promise that's made to Mary seems a little too early, because she hasn't been with a man, you see. Jesus from the Hebrew, Yeshua, uh, Yahweh's Savior. 32. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. That promise made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13. You see, David, King David, wanted to build the Lord a house. And the Lord said, no, David, I didn't ask you to build me a house. I haven't asked anybody to build me a house since the time of the judges. I'm going to build you a house. And of course, that promise fulfilled in this. Do you know the key of David? That key that opens scriptures, opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, all 12 tribes, not just Judah. And of his kingdom there shall be no end forever and ever his dominion. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? I'm a virgin. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Verse 36, And behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son, in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And again, this date, no doubt, December 25th, the conception of Jesus Christ, not the birth of Jesus Christ. 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Message delivered. Skip ahead to chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Sound familiar? Nothing new under the sun. Of course, Caesar Augustus of the Romans, verse 2. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. In other words, his, his heritage, the place of his birth. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, which translated means the house of bread. And the bread of life was born there. 
because he was of the house of lineage of David. And Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, was indeed of David. But he did not come through Nathan, which is the seed line through which Christ would come through. He came through Solomon. Matthew chapter 1 will document that. Verse 5. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. Again, they were engaged. The marriage had not been consummated. Being great with child, she was almost full term. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. It was time for Jesus to be born. Emmanuel, God with us. The prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7 fulfilled. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Uh, the swaddling clothes here is actually a medical term that means bandages. And that was un not uncommon, especially among the Oriental nations of the world, that uh, an infant, they would take long strips of cloth and literally wrap the child up in it. That's what swaddling clothes means. We see a little bit of a thumbprint from Luke there in that Luke uh, was a medical doctor. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. No way was this at the end of December. This was in September. Jesus born on September 29th. Then you would still have uh, shepherds in the field. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Notice in verse 8 that they were watching over the flock by night. In verse 9, the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, shone round about, no doubt lighting up the darkness of the night. What an awesome experience for these shepherds. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The Savior, the Messiah, was born. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, in the city of Bethlehem, David's place of birth as well, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, Christos, the Anointed One. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, uh, goodwill toward men. Prophecy of Isaiah Chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them unto heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. What a blessing. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And you know, it had been written. People who were familiar with God's word would have been expecting this event. A Messiah had been promised. The first advent had come into being. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart, keeping things in perspective. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Quite a, a special honor afforded to them. So we've kind of documented and did it in a little bit of a hurry. If, if anyone uh, is not familiar with that and I went through it too fast, I uh, suggest that you 
uh, catch a special that will be airing entitled Christmas, uh, obviously coming up on that season, or obtain Pastor Arnold Murray's work entitled Christmas, and it will take you through those courses of Abaya and document. But again, as, as Christians come to this knowledge that, you know, really he wasn't born on December 25th, he was conceived on December 25th. So should we celebrate December 25th? You know, some people say that there was some queen of the heavens the Egyptians had that had a son on that day. And therefore, it's a pagan feast day. In conclusion, turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 1. Should we celebrate December 25th? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Oh, there's a lot in that verse. The Word is logos in the Greek. That's Jesus Christ. In the beginning was Jesus Christ. We're not talking about the beginning of this, the second earth and heaven age. We're talking about the beginning of the first earth and heaven age. And Jesus was there and he was with God and he was God. Emmanuel, God with us. The same, this is Logos, Christ, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, talking eternal life, and the life was the light of men. He was the tree of life in the garden. And the light shineth in darkness, just as the Shekinah glory uh, lit up the night sky for the shepherds. And the darkness comprehended it not. It's your choice. You can walk in darkness or you can walk in light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We just read about him. John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, capital L, Jesus Christ, that all men through him might believe. Prophecy fulfilled. He, John the Baptist, was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. He was the forerunner. Make ye straight the way, prepare the way. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world and believes. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. He, all things were made by him, we covered in the verses 2 and 3. And the world knew him not. Indeed, the world knew him not. You see, they, be, they beheaded John the Baptist. They crucified Christ. The world knew him not. That was the first advent. They're sure going to know him at the second advent. Verse 11. He, Messiah, came unto his own, to Israel, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. Salvation after the crucifixion opened to all, including the Gentiles, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the reason we came here in conclusion, verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and the glory as the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Should we celebrate December 25th? The Word became flesh. That is something, beloved, to celebrate. Because as we sign off almost every program at Shepherd's Chapel, Jesus is the living Word. And and thank God that, that God decided to not destroy a third of his children after the first earth age, but instead chose to send a Messiah, a Savior, Emmanuel. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, as we enter this holiday season, Father, let us not forget the, the price that was paid on that cross, Father. 
that, that we all have that chance for eternal life because of your sacrifice, Father. We thank you for that sacrifice. Uh, let us remember as in this holiday season the importance of this season. And that, of course, is not how many gifts we give or how many gifts we receive, Father. The most important gift of all, Father, the gift that you gave to all of us, your son, Emmanuel. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. In John 3.16, that says baptism, that you must be baptized to be saved. And the point that they made and that we often make here at the chapel is that the male factor, you know, he didn't come down off the cross and go down to Jordan and be baptized. Christ said, this day I will see you in paradise. Why? Because he believed on Christ and that's the requirement. Having said that now though, Jesus is our example. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus was baptized, so we should follow that. You know, most people try to attach the requirement that you must be baptized in order to be saved. They attach that to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 3, verse 15, where it states <clears throat> that we must be born of water to enter the kingdom of God. It's not talking about baptism there. Uh, it's talking about we must be born of woman as opposed, born of water, meaning that what happens when the water breaks? Well, the woman has the child and goes into labor at that point. So, uh, but that's a requirement that we be born in the flesh to be saved as opposed to the fallen angels who refuse to be born of woman and came to earth in Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> Carol in Minnesota. Revelation 21.8 states that the fearful, along with others, will be burned up in the second death. My son suffers a mental disorder where he has experienced fear and anxiety in dealing with people uh, throughout his entire life. He has studied with Shepherd's Chapel for about 20 years and serves the Lord the best he can. If he continues to have this fear until the day he dies, will he be burned in the lake of fire? Bless you and your staff for helping us all to understand God's word. And, and thanks for your comments there, Carol. Um, you know, the word fearful that you're talking about in Revelation chapter 21, 8 uh, the Greek word is dilos, and, and what it means, Carol, is faithless. It doesn't mean someone who uh, suffers anxiety attacks or is fearful of this or, or has a phobia uh, concerning that. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about those who are completely, entirely faithless. They, they don't even believe God exists. So. And, and to consider the other group of people that are mentioned there in Revelation 21.8. Uh, we're talking about unbelievers, uh, murderers, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's a bad lot of people there, and they will, uh, many of them, go into the lake of fire with Satan and good riddance. They're not going to be in the eternity causing any more problems. Corinne in Connecticut. Uh, it was one of the happiest days of my life when I stumbled 
upon your program one morning. At last, I found someone else who was teaching more than what I'd found in uh, all many other churches. I tried to attend. Thank you for being there, and you're welcome. It's a, it's a labor of love. My question are these. In Genesis 1, 20 and 21, it states, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl. And you underline the word life, indicating to me that you understand that that means uh, a spirit or soul. And pretty much the same in verse 21. So does all life come from these waters? Question accepting, of course, Adam and Eve. And I believe that the verses you mention uh, possibly were the creation of the Oriental peoples of the world. And if God, you follow with another question, if God hath made in man upright, Ecclesiastes 7.29, would that be the dominion he gave him in Genesis 1, 26 and 28. Well, in Genesis 1, 26 and 28, that dominion, check out the word in your strongs, it means to subjugate. And in other words, God gave man uh, responsibilities, if you will, for managing other uh, animals and beasts on earth, uh, meaning that they were subject to the man. And, and only that only means, does that mean we're better than them? No, it means he gave us responsibilities over them. Sheriff uh, Shira, S-H-E-R-A, from Washington. One, uh, I tried, I'll try to ask the questions as best as I remember and your responses. One was about a daughter. I believe who wasn't walking with the Lord and died in an accident. The mother wanted to know where would she go. Um, you mentioned about the gap separating her eternal home and uh, during the millennium uh, she has a chance to return to the Lord. And I believe what you're talking about is the, the, the millennium being that gap, if you will, or separating uh, the eternity and this flesh life. And you're, you're correct. That's the uh, thousand years mentioned in Revelation uh, chapter 20, verse 4. And, and that will be a time of teaching. But, you know, this daughter who passed away, no, no one knows what went through her mind in her last moments on earth. It could be that she found the Lord and repented. And, you know, but that's not for us to, to judge or not judge. That is totally up to our Heavenly Father. But if she never had a chance to hear the truth uh, during her stay in the flesh life here on earth, <coughs> excuse me, she will have a chance uh, uh, to learn in the millennium a great time of teaching. Gabriel in California... Uh, I'm sorry, I have written twice already and my questions never got answered. Well, this is your lucky day. I heard you say if we worship the Antichrist, we are doomed to hell. Is having a thought the same as worshiping him or is it a physical worship like bowing a knee and accepting his gifts? We have never said here on earth that people who worship the Antichrist are doomed to hell. Um, when we are, when we, we say worship Antichrist, we mean uh, to worship him as God, not necessarily uh, how you do it in bowing down or what you say or anything else. If you believe the Antichrist is Jesus Christ, uh, you are worshiping him and you've been deceived. That's the point. Terry in Indiana, the reason I am writing is I have a question that is bothering me for quite some time. I was told somewhere, and I don't remember where, but that amen means the end or final. 
if that is the case, does this mean the three books that don't end in Amen are unfinished? The third epistle of John, the book of James, you didn't say the, the first book of James, and uh, the book of Acts don't end in Amen. Well, Amen means that's that, or uh, I like to translate it that that, that is truth. Uh, in other words, when someone says something and then someone responds with amen, they're saying what the person said before that is truth and doesn't mean that those books are incomplete. Mildred in Texas, um, why does Pastor Arnold not want to be called reverend? Well, he doesn't believe that any man is worthy of reverence, that, that we should revere our Heavenly Father, not man. Do people still have visions and dreams? Of course people have dreams and visions. The question is always, are uh, they a communication from God, some divine contact, or are they a sour pickle uh, dream, for example? Always know this, that if the vision or the dream confuses you, know that it's not of your Heavenly Father, because your Heavenly Father is not the author of confusion. Satan is the author of confusion. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. You know what? It makes your Father's Day, too, when he looks down from heaven and he sees you with the letter he wrote to you, the Bible open and studying his word makes his day. Blessings will follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. There's one thing that's most important, though, beloved, and it's this. Stay in his word every day. You know, every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.